good morning, church. How are you doing this morning? Great morning? Hey, first service crew on Time Change Weekend, you guys are my heroes. How much caffeine is in the system right now to make this possible? All right, I'm right there with you. If you're online, hey, I get it. I understand it. We'll see you next weekend, but we're glad that you can connect with us today. And if you have a Bible with you, go ahead and open it up to the book of 1 Peter. We're going to be in chapter 5 today, wrapping up our series called Unshakable. Um, Guys, back in the fall of 2014, I had an opportunity to do something that, uh, honestly, I never really thought I'd ever get the opportunity to do. Uh, I had an opportunity to go to a wildlife park uh, in Africa. I was in Uganda doing a uh, a mission trip there, and it was the second to last day. We had been there for a week or so, and uh, had just been an incredible, fruitful experience. And on, on one of the uh, last days, we had a chance to go and see some stuff that Again, I just never dreamed I'd have the opportunity to get a part of seeing. And I've been to the zoos, and I've seen these animals before, so it wasn't the first time I've ever seen them, but I've never had seen them in their native, natural habitat. And there was something to seeing that that was just awe-inspiring. I mean, even... Even some of the birds, and, and, or, the, or the hippos, or the giraffes, or the elephants, just incredible to see them in their in their native uh, environment. Of course, one of the things that I was hoping to see while we were there was some lions. Wanted to see some lions in the wild in Africa. And so we were uh, just, just uh, three of us on our trip that went from Washington State over to Uganda. And then we had a pastor there, Pastor Ronald, who was our guide. And we didn't pay any money to go on this. We just got into the park. Uh, we didn't pay for a guide or anything like that. Ronald had been there, done that a number of times. He knew some of the tricks. And he said, no, we're not going to spend any money on a guide. We will just drive around the park until we find the people who did spend money on a guide. And when they stop, we'll park right next to them. And I was like, you sound like you've done this before. He said, all the time. So we did that. We drove around the park a couple different times. And all of a sudden, as we're driving, we see that there's a truck uh, parked. And there's a guy with a telephoto lens. I mean, just gigantic. And he's taking pictures of something. And so you're like, okay. So we pull up near them, and they kind of give us a little bit of a frown as we clamor out of the van. And, 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 and then we get a look at what they're seeing, and it's a pride of lions out in the field, probably nine of them. And I mean, it's just, it's just awe-inspiring, right? It's just awe-inspiring. And so I get out my phone, my like iPhone 4 or whatever I had at the time, and I'm, I'm trying to take pictures because my eyes are seeing something that's incredible. But have you ever had that experience where you're taking a picture and then you look at the picture and you go, oh my, that doesn't, I mean, I wouldn't even share this. This isn't even, this doesn't look anything like what my eyes are seeing right now. And I'd zoom it and I'd try to get a better look and it just got more pixelated and it was just terrible. So, you know, sometimes in life, you just got to shoot your shot. So I turned to the guy who had the telephoto lens that was this big. And I said, hey, I didn't even know if he could speak English. I mean, we're in Uganda. Who knows, right? Turns out the guy's from Austria. They go, would you, if I give you my email, would you send me some of the pictures that you're taking today? And he said, yeah, give me your email. And Herbert Kratke from Austria Later that night, hey, mate, here's the pictures you requested. And he sent me pictures far better than the ones that I got on my iPhone. Take a look at a couple of these. Just look at that beast. Look at that. Look at the scars on it. Been in some battle. Love it. Love it. This is a few of them just kind of laying and and spending some time together. Uh, As as I was was watching this uh, happening, and we stayed there for probably 45 minutes or so just watching these guys. One of the thoughts that ran through my head was, I, I want to send a video back because we were going to miss a Sunday. It was, it was over the week. I was missing a Sunday. And uh, I said, let's film a, an update right here, and I'll send it back uh, at, in, when we get back to the house, and they can show this at all the services over the weekend, right? Be a cool mission update from the field. And so I go out, and I'm like, okay, so you guys, you, here's my phone, and, and you film, and I start to walk uh, out a little bit towards the lions, 
And I turn my back, and they're trying to get the shot in, and I'm backing up a little bit, getting closer and closer. And finally, Ronald, who's been kind of our, I mean, he was, he was fun. He was a lot of fun, not necessarily a, a no-nonsense guy. Like, he, he, we enjoyed each other's company a lot when we spent time together. He goes, stop. That's close enough. And I'm like, man, it looks like it's still a ways, you know? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty confident that... They're not, like, like I've ever been in this moment before. And I'm like, I'm pretty confident I'm okay here, right? And he, and he goes, film from the van with the van slider door open. He goes, as soon as you turn your back and you start getting closer to them, you open the door to the van and Josh is going to be in the van filming. And he said, if I say now, without hesitation... Without turning around, you have to get in the van now. And we'll shut the door and get out of here. I'm like, oh my. Like, this is real deal. Like, we are in the wild here. Like, this, there's no wall. There's no, there's no fence. There's no glass. There's nothing that's going to protect. So I did the video update, but this whole time while I'm doing this update, like, he had me spooked. I've been fine the whole time. Felt like we were good. Like we weren't going to be really in danger. But man, with your back turned to a pride alliance and you can't see where they're coming or if they're coming and you've got a spotter whose job is to stand behind the guy filming and to say, now, if it gets dangerous, I mean, it changes dramatically the experience of the whole thing. It reminds me of the text that we're looking at today. Where Peter, as he wraps up this section of text that we're in, says, Be alert and of sober mind, because your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace who's called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you've suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Peter has been teaching throughout this book kind of an overarching theme. He's been writing the... uh, a group of Christians who are in a very difficult moment, a very difficult circumstance. Persecution is rampant. Very violent persecution uh, was a threat that was a, a very real reality for these guys every single day. He's been inspiring them to stand firm in the faith. This is going to be his final chapter. These are some of his final words. And I think you can almost start to see, sense that he's, he's summing some things up, not just for his audience then, but for us today that are going to be true. These are realities that will follow every person, every believer from this moment until the moment that Jesus calls you home. Two realities that will make up the rest of your time on this earth. And here's the two realities. While Jesus is trying to make your life wonderful, simultaneously... Satan is trying to make your life miserable. Those are the two realities that will be the two realities that dominate your experience in life on this earth. Both are real. Both are present. We're talking about a literal, when we say the devil, a literal evil being who's viciously opposed to God. Jesus said in John 8, that he's a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, There's no truth in him that when he lies, he speaks his native language because he's the father of all lies. New Testament scholar, William Mounts, and William Mounts, for for anybody that studies New Testament Greek, Mounts writes all the books. All the books that you learn uh, New Testament Greek from, he's the guy who who wrote them all, all right? So this is a guy who studied the Greek language probably like, like no one else. He says, here's his summary of the New Testament's testimony of the devil. He's a tempter, a liar, and a murderer. He claims to hold authority over the world and holds unbelievers captive to his will. He can prompt people to sin, even those close to Jesus. He's a devious schemer who sneaks enemies of the gospel into the church and snatches the gospel from some who hear it. His works are always painful, though often subtle. 
always painful, though often subtle. Here's again, these two realities. God is good all the time. God is always working to make your life wonderful and a better picture of how he's created you to be. God has a plan for you, a plan to prosper you, a plan to grow you, a plan to deepen your faith, plans for a bright future simultaneously. While God has those plans for you simultaneously, the devil is trying to, to steal, kill, and destroy you and everything that God is trying to do in you. Right now, even as we sit here, right now, even as we sit here, our adversary is working to destroy you. And part of what Peter is trying to get us to grab a hold of here is the seriousness and the gravity of the fight that's going on every single day in ways that our eyes can't perceive. If you're married, there is an adversary right now who is fighting to divide you and your wife, you and your spouse. Right now, it's happening. You may be sitting next to each other, but actively right now, Satan is trying not to just damage you or inflict a wound or two, but to destroy you and to destroy your marriage and to destroy your relationship. And his goal every single day is to tear you and your spouse apart. I don't know if you wake up and think about that every day, but every day the enemy is trying to destroy you and everything that's valuable to you, your marriage, your relationships, every relationship that you have, your relationship with your children, your relationship with your best friends, your relationship with your parents or your siblings, your relationships with, with friends and neighbors, and every interaction, every time you're with them, there is an attempt to not just mess it up, but to kill and destroy relationship. That, that, that's his game. And that's his end game. And that's what he's trying to do. He'll do it with your finances. Every time you spend money, every time you justify a purchase, every time you make a plan to spend or to do so, he's trying to wreck you. He's trying to kill you. He's trying to destroy you. In areas of sexuality, purity, this is an area that Satan loves to do work. And his end game, his end game is, is, is to kill you. To absolutely humiliate and destroy you. By urging you over and over and over again just to continue to chase the desire. And to feed that desire. His goal is to destroy you. To kill you. To take every ounce of hope that you have away that that's what's going on every single day, even as we speak right now. The enemy is at work. While God is trying to make your life wonderful, Satan is trying to make your life miserable. That's why I think this last chapter, chapter 5, has this kind of overarching tone, and this overarching message, and it's to everybody. Whether young or old, whether, whether new in the faith, or whether someone who's been walking for a long, long time with Jesus, like Peter had been by the time he wrote this. And here's the, here's the big picture. Here's the big idea of 1 Peter 5. Stay ready for the fight to stay steady in the faith. Stay ready for the fight to stay steady in your faith. Most of us are, are wanting a stronger faith, a steadier faith, a, a, a more, a, a deeper faith. Peter is helping us say, see, that to accomplish that, you've got to be ready to battle every day. You've got to be ready for the fight every day. When you're doing God's work, opposition is inevitable. When you're becoming the person that God wants you to be, opposition is inevitable. He's going to work overtime to try to stop you. The closer you get to doing what God wants done, or the closer that you get to being the person that God wants you to be, 
the harder the enemy is going to work, not just to stop you, but to destroy you, to destroy you. Listen, the wind blows the hardest at the top of the mountain. And so the closer you get and the further you walk and the deeper you become committed to Jesus, you shouldn't expect an easier fight. It should be expected to be harder. That doesn't mean we throw in the towel. That doesn't mean we quit. But part of the reason steady faith evaporates from many in the church is because they're not prepared to fight. Every day, they're walking into a battle unarmed. They're caught off guard. They're not prepared for what's coming their way. One of my favorite stories in all the Bible is the story of Nehemiah in the Old Testament. And the leadership principles that are there are so, so, so deep. There's so many different metaphors. There's so many different pictures that I think um, come to mind at different points in my life and in my ministry, in my leadership here at church or in, in, in my home. But one of the principles that comes out of the story there that I think is worth mentioning here connects to the, the construction project that's going on. The, the story of Nehemiah is about a construction project that, that is going on to build a wall around a city. God is going to bring, he's brought his people back from the dead. That's the story. They were carried off into captivity. And so this is the, the chosen people of God carried off into captivity, seemingly gone now as a nation. They have no land. They have no standing. They have nothing until God grabs a hold of the heart of a pagan king. And he writes a decree that says all these, uh, all these uh, people from Israel, I'm going to give you some land. I'm going to give you some material and you can go back and you can go rebuild. Nehemiah becomes the leader of this rebuilding project. And so they're building a wall. Without a wall, there's no security. There's no, there's no protection, right? So this is the first of, a, of several building projects that God's going to do over the course of the next uh, half century or so, or, or, or half millennium or so. He's going to rebuild the city, then he's going to rebuild the temple, and then he's going to rebuild the people through Jesus. Step one was rebuild the city. Let's build a wall. So Nehemiah says to his uh, people there that are gathered up, these exiles who are now establishing a new, new home and a new life, he says, everybody's going to build outside their own backyard. Everybody's building the wall closest to their house. That makes sense, right? Because where are you going to try the hardest? <laughs> where are you going to make sure your craftsmanship is the best? Well, on your part of the wall, because that's the part that protects your house and your family. So everybody's working, and you're going to work right outside your house, right outside your part of the wall. But then he says this, look, there's a lot of opposition. You read that book, and you'll see that there's a lot of people who do not want this wall project to happen. There's a bunch of people that get involved to try to stop it in a number of different ways, whether through legal, illegal, threat, violence, all that stuff. So here's what Nehemiah tells everybody. He goes, there will be times when you will have to have a sword in one hand and a trowel in the other hand. You're laying bricks and the trowel is for the brick laying. The sword is for the threat of fight that is coming any given moment. And he doesn't hide behind that. He does, in fact, he even puts some guys whose sole job is to stand guard for the guys who are working so that they can work, we're going to be ready to spring an attack on anything that comes our, our way. That is such an incredible metaphor for the kind of, of readiness that we have to have in our life on this earth. While we live in the two realities that while God is trying to make our life wonderful, Satan is trying to make our life miserable. We got to have a, a sword in one hand ready for battle, and we've got to have a trial in the other, building the life that God has called us to be. But to stay ready for the, uh, re to stay ready for the fight, to stay steady in the faith. We've got to fight the lies. We've got to fight the deception. Part of doing that is watching out for traps. 
Everybody's different, but we all have traps that we fall for. Maybe you fell for one yesterday. Something that Satan loves to lure you in, entice some desires, give you reason to justify, and you find yourself on the other side of it, living in the consequences, just wallowing in frustration that it happened again. Sometimes we say, ah, it's just a little bit of sin. Just a little bit of a misstep from where God wanted me to be. Guys, a little bit of sin is like being a little pregnant. Pretty soon, eventually, it's going to get big and it's going to come out. This is, the way it, this is the way it goes. We've lived those realities. But all of this starts from lies. Satan's game is lies. His weapon is lies. And he speaks them well. And he speaks them into our life in such a convincing way that often our life is lived as a fulfillment, not of God's promises, but of the lies that Satan speaks to us. Peter is calling us to fight the battle against the lie. Fight the battle against the lie. I'll give you a practical way to do it. Practical way to do it. I'm going to, I don't know what the lie is for you. One of the lies that Satan loves to speak to me is this one. You won't finish well. I wear that especially different, I guess, in some ways because of the, the role or the ministry that I have and plan to have for my career. And there's an interpretation that I have that's directly tied to that. But I could apply it also to my marriage, to my life with my kids. You won't finish well. That's the lie that I hear all the time from Satan. Maybe you have one. Something that he speaks to you, that he gets in your head, that he gets in your mind. I want to encourage you, if you're so bold to do it, take your shoe, grab a pen from in front of you, and just write that lie on that shoe. I'm just going to write, won't finish well. On the bottom of my shoe, you can write it on yours. Here's what I want you to do. Walk the hell out of that lie. That's not from God. That's not his promise. Hold on to the promises that God has put over you and over your life. And every day you walk the hell out of that lie. And you live in the truth. You live in what God has called you to be. If you want to stay steady in the faith, You've got to stay ready for the fight. How do you do that? How do you resist the devil? How do you resist him? I looked up synonyms for the, the word resist. Combat, repel, thwart, maintain. But I found this fascinating on thesaurus.com that the number one synonym, the first one listed for resist was the word Abide. Abide. What did Jesus tell his disciples in John chapter 15? He said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. You remain in me, you'll bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do, what does he say? Nothing. You can do nothing. Jesus is inviting us in that moment. Life is often one, we've got it, sometimes we focus on the wrong end of the branch. We're trying to manufacture life, and we're trying to manufacture behavior. Sometimes when you're in hard time, you're trying to manufacture faith. And so we're out on the, the, the leaf or the fruit end of the branch trying to make things happen, and Jesus goes, it's at the other end, guys. You have one job, it's to remain. It's to remain in me. You remain in me. 
and you will stay strong. You will bear fruit. Abide is the verb form of the word dwelling place. That's our job. Is not to focus on the wrong things or the things that we can't control. But to focus on God in all times. Be ready for the fight. To stay steady in the faith. Verse 6 of chapter 5 says, Humble yourselves, therefore under the mighty hand of God, so that the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. You know, every season in life seems to bring a fresh set of anxieties. Um, this week marks the two-year window of, of when everything shut down. And when, when life changed, it was a whole new set of anxieties that none of us had ever had before. I've had different journeys in my life. When we first got married, that was a whole other set of anxieties that I had never had before in my life. How am I going to do this? How am I going to take my selfish person and place it in the, in, the, in the room with somebody else every single day and make this work? How are we going to make enough to live? How are we going to, you have kids, how are we going to have enough to live? And that, you know, you, it's new anxieties everywhere you go. We've got anxieties right now around our world. Every time I pull into the gas pump, I get anxiety. What's it going to be this time? I was getting gas yesterday, and I was in a plane field, and it was the slowest pump in the history of the world. I mean, it was the slowest pump. And I thought, maybe they were making them slower so that you could just have time to adjust to the pain as it was filling. <laughs> Every time. The, the war that's going on right now. It's, it's, it's anxiety. It's frustrating. We're watching this unfold, and we don't know what's happening. We don't know where it's going. Inflation. It's staying harder. It's getting harder and harder and harder to stay ahead. Fear is real. And Peter's reminding us to stay ready for the fight. Sometimes that fight is just the fight against worry and anxiety. It's the fight against selfishness and self-preservation. He's saying, humble yourself, throw your anxiety. That's the image there. Throw it on Jesus. And, you know, something to think about with Peter. You really got to lean in here because Peter is... You know, when I, when I get to heaven, after I've spent some quality time with Jesus, on the list, like near the top of people that I want to find and I want to spend some time talking to, is Peter. He, for me, is, is such a spiritual hero because he kept the faith. He held on in hard times, moment after moment after moment. He's been humbled, humbled by, by his failures, humbled by the cross, humbled by the weight of leadership. I don't know if there's anybody who's more capable of speaking what he's saying than Peter. He's been there. He's done that. And he's convinced that it's worth it to keep following Jesus his closing words in the book of First Peter come in verse 14, where he says, Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Peace. Peace. That's part blessing. That's part exhortation. That's part invitation. Peace. You know, if Peter had understood or experienced anything in Jesus, it was peace. Peace from anxiety. Peace from fear peace from the battle that was going on between him and God. I mean, all this comes to a head, of course, at the resurrection. Jesus' most famous follower, his fearless follower, who had seemingly rejected his faith in Jesus, denying him. When the angels appear at the tomb to the women, they give the women this specific instruction about what they're to do. They tell the ladies, go tell the disciples and Peter. Go tell the disciples, and then Peter is singled out, and Peter about what's happened. 
Where's Peter? He's out fishing. He's out wallowing in his mistakes. Beating himself up probably, wouldn't you? Go get Peter. And go remind him of where his hope comes from. Go remind him that our hope is founded in Jesus and that even when life on this earth looks at its greatest despair, we never lose hope when we are with Jesus. Go tell the disciples and Peter. Friends, if Peter was here today, I think he could look out with, 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 with such pastoral care and on the one hand have a tear coming out of one eye sympathizing and empathizing for the pain that's in the room but also with a grit and a determination and a fire in his eye on the other side and with both sides with both the empathy and just this forceful passion this victorious edge he would call us all to remember where we place our hope. It's not in this world. It's in the things of the next. It's in the things of God, not in the things of this world. We never forget where our hope comes from. 1 John 4, 4, greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. Romans 8, 31, if God is for us, who can stand against us? John 16, 33, from Jesus's mouth, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart for I have overcome the world. I want to invite you in this moment to respond to that. Maybe for the first time to respond to Jesus and say, I want you, I want the truth to be the grounding for my life. I'm ready to reject the lies and embrace the truth. And if that's your decision, as we sing these next songs, I'll be in the back waiting for you. Love to talk and pray with you. Online, our hosts are reaching out, providing opportunity right now for you to respond. Click the button. Take that step. For some of you, maybe this is a moment to cast anxiety on God, the things that are weighing you down, the things of this world that are just killing you, to cast them on Him. Maybe it's to reconcile with somebody. Maybe there's a relational issue that's sorted, that's gone sideways, and it's time to get that straight. This is a trust in Jesus moment. Not, I want to trust him more later, some point in life, but now this is a moment for me to take my next step with him. Live in the truth. Reject the lies. Stay steady in the faith by being ready for the fight every day. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you and thank you. And God, we, we place our, our trust in you. You are where our hope comes from. You are the, the help. You are where our eyes are fixed. And Father, we look at the examples that have gone before us and find great encouragement and comfort in knowing that you have gone before us. And as you have been in the past, so you will be in the future. So God, we lean in to you to carry us through this moment. All our anxieties, all our struggles, all our worries, we place them on you. We look to the cross and we remember that it's in that place that reality was established about you and about us, and that reality is the only reality that matters. May we see that through your eyes today. It's in your name.